everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Amali. I'm the events coordinator here at Books Are Magic. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, before we get started, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's going to go. First off, we do ask that you keep your mask on, uh, covering both your nose and mouth at all times while at this event. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk tonight, Lydia will be signing and personalizing books at the desk behind us near the side door. Uh, we also have additional books available for purchase, and if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to, get, to buy a copy of Thrust online using the link in the live, the live stream description. <laughs> so with that in mind, we're very excited to introduce Lydia Yuknovich and Maris Kreisman, who are here celebrating the release of Lydia's newest novel, Thrust. Trust is a truly unique experience. This novel touches on so many timely themes, including climate change, immigrant and workers' rights, freedom, feminism, land appropriation, and indigenous histories. We, along with many of the characters, are guided by the young protagonist, Lysbe, as she travels between centuries carrying objects, stories, and people with her through the waters of time. That's really all I can get into regarding the plot without spoiling anything, so I'll wrap up by saying this book is strange and confusing and moving and beautiful, and if you haven't read it yet or haven't purchased it yet, I hope this conversation tonight gives you all the reasons you need to do so. Lydia Yukinovich is the nationally best-selling author of the novels The Book of Joan, The Small Backs of Children, and Dora, A Headcase, and the story collection Verge, and the memoir, The Chronology of Water. She is the recipient of two Oregon Book Awards and has been a finalist for the Brooklyn Public Library Literary Prize and the Penn Center USA Creative Nonfiction Award. She lives in Portland, Oregon. And as I mentioned before, Maris Kreisman joins Lydia in conversation tonight. Maris is the host of The Maris Review, an intimate weekly literary podcast produced by LitHub. Her essays and criticism have appeared in the New York Times, the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, Vanity Fair, Publishers Weekly, and more. So please, without any further delay, join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Lydia and Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, items. Um, if you'll, can you do this again? <laughs> if you'll give me uh, one indulgent second to express some gratitude, um, the world's greatest agent and beloved friend, soul warrior, Rehane Sanders is here. Could you please stand up and give her a hand? Uh, without this person, I don't exist in the world. And not everybody can be, you know, soul sisters with their uh, someone who started out as a, their agent. And I, this is a ride or die person, and so watch out. <laughs> and I also want to thank my publicist, Glory Plata. I'm sorry I have to. Could you stand up, please? You are so amazing. What was that? <laughs> I am so grateful and, and just in love with meeting you and I understand exactly how hard the labor is and it's art and heart labor so I want to say it out loud and tell everyone okay. And then there's a fella <laughs> who, um, this is so rare. Uh, Calvert Morgan is my editor at Riverhead and that's amazing and all, but um, I've never met anyone who can uh, kind of see inside the nest mess of my imagination. And here, here's what he does. This is so phenomenal. He can see it and then he can like ask you questions about the material. That's a nice way to put it. 
um, th that pulls out tendrils of story, like threads of story. And this is like a once in a generation kind of editor. We don't have very many of them anymore. And he's one of them. And I thank you with my whole body. I wouldn't get to make the art I make if I hadn't met you. So would you please accept our gratitude just for existing? <laughs> I know what's what. <laughs> um, I'm getting there. <laughs> Can we do one thing together? Because I haven't seen you as a group in so long. <laughs> this is weird. We're back in a bookstore. If you feel like it and you're able to do this, could you stand up briefly? So here's what we're going to do. On the count of three, if you're feeling it, as a group, we're going to say one word, chorally, and that one word, you got the instructions? Two, three. A lot. Okay, that was pretty good. Um, now we're going to do it again. Now you're getting ready, aren't you? You know, <laughs> she's like squaring off. You know what's happening. With a little more of two things. Everything we've been holding in for too long. Can I say that? And we're in the big apple. And if you ever read Thrust, that will mean something <laughs> curious at some point. So we're going to do it again with a little more decibel is what I'm saying. A little more chest and breath. And You ready? One, two, three. Alive! Alive. Okay, okay, almost. I'm waiting for the hairs <laughs> on my arm drop. One more time. This time I need you to speak to the west coast <laughs> from your east coast <laughs> to help them <laughs> they're missing just a smidge <laughs> you hear me one two three Alive! Alive! okay it worked i got the hairs on my heart <laughs> you may be seated thank you so much you're beautiful hello raluca <laughs> You have just participated in a polyphonic novel. So congratulations. And one more bit of gratitude, Samin. My mother is gone. And the fact that you're here tonight um, gives me something I don't have anymore, if I ever had it. And I'm so grateful to know you, and I'm so grateful you're here to remind us that generations are not nothing. They're the reason we're still here. So please accept my humble gratitude for being here. Now I'm going to mop up for a second. <laughs> I love you. I'm just going to read a teeny bit from the very beginning in a choral opening, and then we're going to talk. I don't poke myself in the eye. Crucis one. We dreamed we were hers. The body of us thought that because we built her, we belonged to her. We built her in pieces from our bodies, from the stories we held and the stories before that and the stories that might come. When the ship Isera finally reached port, we wept. The sailors wept too. They'd been convinced that the tempest they'd endured on board would drown them in the ocean and the cargo with them. The deck of the ship was nearly a farmer's field in size. The hold had been covered with huge black tarps for the journey. When the sailors pulled the tarps back, the hold looked dark and foreboding. I was asked to jump into that beautiful dark, like plunging into the ocean's deep. Down in the hold, my eyes adjusted. Gigantic crates the size of houses filled with pieces of the Colossus a woman in slices, crated and shipped. One by one, we found her. Hair, nose, crown, eyes, mouth, fingers, 
hand, foot, torch. She had arrived in pieces of a self. We were woodworkers, iron workers, roofers and plasterers and brick masons. We were pipe fitters and welders and carpenters. We mixed concrete, we pounded earth, we armed the saws and drills. We were sheet metal and copper specialists. She arrived in our hands in 31 tons of copper and 125 tons of steel. We were cooks and cleaners and nuns and night watch people. We were nurses and artists and janitors and runners and messengers and thieves and mothers and fathers and grandparents and sisters and brothers and children. During the day, you could hear the insistent hammering, the files grating, the chains clanking, the copper singing as it was being shaped over wooden scaffolds, the orchestra of our labor. You could always see arms swinging, hands at work, shoulders and biceps and jaws of the workers flexing and grinding. Those sounds, those sounds were our bodies, her body coming to life through our hands. We, the body, took pride in that labor as if we expected that someone would know our names or carry our stories. Sometimes, for just a moment, a body can feel real inside a story that way, as if we existed. Thank you. to be able to be talking to you in Brooklyn, or as you might call it in the book, the brook, um, in the shadow, basically, of the Statue of Liberty. Um, I, I think, I'll, I'll say for myself at least, that I kind of forget what an enormous undertaking uh, the building of it was, how, how awesome it is, um, and, and thanks for reminding me. Us. My pleasure. Um, how do you make the Statue of Liberty sound erotic? <laughs> well, it's such a sexy figure to me. Uh, I, I often think of it as a trans figure, so I should get that off my chest. <laughs> I, I don't feel the lady part as much as some other people do. Or if I do, it's a kind of woman we haven't defined yet. Can I say it like that? Like the word woman moves and needs new meanings. Um, but I was writing love letters to laborers. I kept trying to write about the workers and they kept turning out as even more sentimental <laughs> than those. They kept turning into gushy, you know, I love workers, I love having worked alongside workers, and so this eroticism came out. Um, and the more I wrote about actual bodies of workers, not the concept, not the philosophy, not the laws and rules that get projected onto workers, but the actual body of someone who labors. Um, I started scratching at a story that comes from the inside out of a body and not the world down upon bodies. And to me, that's sexy. Or I wish that was sexy. <laughs> I, I do love the, the way you describe work, even in the, in the first pages. Um, in America, of course, we are told we work for money, but you remind us that there are other reasons. Well, I mean, we do work for money because, I mean, you have to make a living and you have to feed yourself and your families, and that is true, and that's capitalism, like, thrusting at us all the time. But then there's the, the fact of one's labor that isn't just capitalism, and... My questions are, um, can we still tell that story? Is there song in that story? Who are the bodies? And can we stop erasing them so that capital is the only story, you know? Um, and you remember Workers of the World Unite? 
Um, I'm still down with that. <laughs> and uh, there may, must be a new version of it available to us in the face of what's going down right now. And I may not know perfectly what it is yet, but I'm willing to believe we still have imagination, bodies, and hearts. And if we could find the song with each other again, there's still a chance. Um, so the word worker for me is everything in this story. Yeah, of course. I, and I'm wondering how you went about actually pulling out all of those stories that started to bubble up. I, it seems like you did a lot of research and that you have a wide imagination. It's so, true. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. Oh, it's a mess. <laughs> this is why Cal is such a genius. I, I uh, became immersed in research because I'm, I'm, raise your hand if you're a nerd. <laughs> it's a dumb question to ask. In the <laughs> I love research. I could die there. I think it's amazing, but not because I care about facts, facts or history. I <laughs> just like, uh, I like research as a form of archaeology or diving into the sediments of what's happened. And then my imagination is kind of like that too. It's like this weird ocean with dead things and live things and sediments. So when research meets Lydia Brain, this, um, this imaginal world emerges where I wish I could stay forever. And when I first turned drafts in, <laughs> they're, um, as I said, a beautiful nest nest of chaos. And luckily, I have humans who help extract my storytelling from that, because I need help. It, it's nutty in there. But I do think it, it seems like in this novel, you open the world up for what could be possible. Time is not linear. Uh, we go through space and time. But you must have had some rules that you had to stick with while you were writing, just structurally. Tell me about balancing that. Well, OK. <laughs> um, here, here's an image of it. Um, if you stand at an intersection, and you know, like a roundabout intersection, and there are lines of traffic coming at you for all, from all directions, and, and you're the focal point, but you're not in control of any of these lines of traffic that are coming. Um, that's like a flashpoint in time and space where you are, but you can't control any of the threads, right? And so in the book, uh, the character encounters are like flashpoints that come and go at an intersection in life, in speedy fractals. Are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. And why that seemed useful as a rule <laughs> or a structure is that that's how I feel like, that's what it feels like for me to be in life right now. That all the themes and heavinesses and stuff that's happening to us, it's too much. There are too many. And you try to care about one thing and reach for it, and then 10 other things come, and you're failing at those other things, right? Because you can't care about all of them at once, right? Um, and so I thought, well, what would that look like on the page, where the stories are crisscrossing and overlapping or making interstices, and then a character holds it for a second, and then they release it. And then the next character comes, and they hold it for a second, and they release it. And that's what I feel like it's like to be alive right now. Sorry, that was kind of wordy, but... America. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about... We were talking earlier about how this book is billed as a dystopia. And yet, there's so much hope. Tell me about constructing what a dystopia probably looks like right now. Like we all have some ideas of like uh, where things could go, and then and then not emerging. I know we almost stayed back there talking about this. <laughs> it's such a great kind of question. 
It used to be that dystopias came in science fiction and it was a future fear place. Um, when I was writing the story of Thrust, I was just trying to be precise about the present tense. So it's not like a dystopia away from us. We already did the things, we're already in it. Uh, and so that's hard knowledge, right? And yet, what I see every day in my life, and you do too, um, individuals are, are loving each other. And nobody's saving anybody, but we take turns holding pieces of what the shit is. And then the next person holds it for a little while. And so I was thinking about what if love and hope could be body to body or hand to hand? And what would holding and carrying and releasing and passing it to the next person look like? And so I made characters who do that. To me, that's hopeful. To me, that's a small kind of redefined hope where you're not looking at the sky or looking to some weird savior figure. Right? You're just looking at the person next to you and going, could you hold this for a second? Because I can't. So I was trying to develop that idea. I, I love that. I'm, I'm looking at my notes. I'm not being rude and checking my phone right now, I promise. It's OK with me. Uh, um, there is a line in the novel that I felt like, this is such a Lydia Yuknovich line. Uh -oh. <laughs> Stories have a way of burying themselves underneath skin. Tell me about that. Whoa. <laughs> I mean, so, <laughs> so if you've met me, or even if you haven't met me, uh, I do believe that you're all walking around carrying everything that's ever happened to you in kind of like story sediments in your bodies. And even if you don't agree with me, you don't have to agree with me. It's just an idea I have. Okay? And so my questions are, why do we keep looking outside of ourselves to find stories to help us? figure ourselves out or what's happened to us out when we're carrying everything we need to know. That would make a map. That would make like a heart path. And when we get with other people who have maps and heart paths, we share them. So if you could just for like tonight, imagine that the stories you're carrying in your body aren't just the chronic back pain <laughs> or aren't just the so I'm a somatizer so when something's wrong it comes through my body they're not just the illnesses or the pains or the tears or the headaches or the whatever they're also trying to tell you something they're trying to get your attention and say there's a story path out of this but you'd have to see me as something besides your trauma. And again, I'm no wizard. I don't have the answers on it. I just think it's an interesting possibility. And I'm willing to talk to people about it and write weird stories about it. I love, it. I, I love that in the novel, you, there are many points in the narrative where we stop and someone tells their story. Um, Many. <laughs> tell, tell me about that. The best people I've ever met in my life, when you go to them with a problem, they don't try to fix it or answer it. They go, let me tell you a story. <laughs> and probably the very first place I ran into that was my Lithuanian grandmother. But it was almost like it was so frustrating. Just tell me what the fuck to do. Just tell me what to do. I'm, I'm messed up here. Um, but the idea that the answer isn't a conclusion or something to consume, but the answer is you retraveling the stories of your own being and your ancestors and whoever's coming next, and it's inside the motion of storytelling, that is such a beautiful healing place that reminds you you have an imagination. You're not just an action person. 
with logic, <laughs> who makes choices <laughs> from consuming the data. <laughs> Storytelling is like this liberation ocean because a story could go anywhere. It could go backwards, it could go forwards, it could go sideways, it could change, it could liberate you, it could imprison you. Storytelling itself could go anywhere. It's like oceans in that way. And so in this world, it makes sense that animals can talk and that Clearly. trees, yeah, right. And the water understands. Um, tell me, I, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I feel like the thing I was expecting when the turtle started talking on page 20 something was like, oh, is she, is she gonna learn from animals throughout this whole book? And the answer is no. It, it's used very sparely. Um, so, so tell me about what the turtle or the whale or the earthworms yeah. mean. Yeah. Well, I can't tell you what they mean, but they can. <laughs> Um, but I understand the question, and so they weren't meant to be magical creatures with the wisdoms or new myths or, you know, like exoticized figures in the story. They're just, again, versions of flashpoints that could happen at anyone at any time, day or night, that you're walking around in the world. You really could ask a tree a question. It's older than you. It knows more than you. It's been here longer. You could ask a tree a question. You could ask a worm a question. You could look down instead of up. Uh, these are normal, regular things we could be doing on a daily basis, which is why I didn't want to make a magical creatures from the magical <laughs> land who could give you stardust and, you know. Um, and they're pissed. They're frustrated and angry because they're trying to endure in a world we've made that kills them. And so I was just, you know, kind of illuminating some moments where they get to remind us of something they could remind us of any second of any day if we were just looking or listening differently. Yeah. Um, I, I, I am so struck by how all of these voices come together and, and, and basically just say, look within. Um, tell me a little bit about the character of, wait, don't let me uh, mispronounce this name, Latsva? You can pronounce it any way you want. I will tell you this, it depends on the Lithuanian you speak to. Oh, well, which, which one would you prefer? <laughs> there's a Laisve with Lice. the I kind of drawn out, and there's a speed version of it, which is Laisve. And there, so it kind of depends, which is true of most languages <laughs> and peoples. But uh, anything you say works for me because language is part of the story. Um, but I like Laisve because it almost has the word life in it. Oh, Laisve. And, and Lysa's mother, of course, was a linguist. Who yes. also understood the importance of language. Yes. Um, I'm a little obsessed with the way languages move, and so I try to sneak it into everything I write. <laughs> uh, I fret about languages dying out um, and what that means for us culturally and as a species. Um, but another thing I love about language is, you know, humans order it. Um, away from humans, it ha it's more like the ocean or water again. And we put it into grammar and sentences and communicable orders. But that doesn't mean it couldn't be rearranged at any moment. If somebody really wanted to, like Gertrude Stein wanted to, for example, or poets. Poets are rearranging language all the time, right? To achieve different meaning making. And so um, the characters in this story actually start moving language around, or at least Lysve does. It, with the idea being that words we've become too um, bound by, like liberty, 
might loosen back up into pieces and be rearranged and, and form a story differently. Um, that's the idea. And Lysa is just a central conduit figure of that. She's not a main character, she's a carrier. Say more about carriers and, and what they do. Well, um, props to Ursula K. Le Guin. If you'd like to give it up to her, <laughs> briefly you can. She's amazing. Uh, she wrote an essay you can look up about a carrier theory of fiction. Um, and quickly, what if the coordinates for plot and storytelling that rely on a unified subject who encounters a conflict, overcomes the conflict, and then maybe has resolution or something like it in a kind of patriarchal order of storytelling, or a hero's journey order of storytelling, what if that entire mythos or philosophy shifted? And instead of that trope, there was a carrier and holding trope. And how might that change the storytelling aims and what the characters do and what they result in if carrying or holding or transferring to another was the main point of, the point of the story. And so I love that idea so much. First I peed my pants. <laughs> Just, dude. <laughs> and then I made a character who literally does that and put her in motion to see what would happen. And I delighted in the non-resolutions and the circular motions and the transferring of love and energy to other characters. I delighted in it, I highly recommend it. I love that. Um, tell me a, bit, a little bit more about water in the, in the novel too. I mean, being that we are in the brook, uh, when, when we see it in 2079, it's, it's kind of a mess. <laughs> It, it reminds me of so many different disaster movies, like where is the water coming to on the, the Statue of Liberty? <laughs> yeah, so that's not like some weird disaster fiction I grabbed out of the sky. There's a great book, um, but uh, last name Magnuson, can't pronounce first two names <laughs> of Time and Water that just basically lays out for you from an anthropology point of view, some parts of our country are losing their water, perhaps you've seen that in the news, radically and quickly in a single lifetime, which is different than it used to be in what we call the past. Other parts of our country and the globe, the water is rising much faster than we wish. <laughs> and so I didn't make up an idea that came out of my butt in a disaster scenario. Uh, I was tracking the science and the data and I just tried to articulate what's going on with this, you know, life giving, life taking, also we're made of it, element. And I played it out in as many ways as I could think of. Um, I wonder, that, that leads me to ask if you could tell us a little bit about iron walking. Sure. Um, it's still called that. Your tallest buildings, the people who get up on the scaffoldings, it's still called walking the iron, which is such a beautiful phrase and storytelling, also dangerous, also labor. Um, and it has a long history I encourage us all to remind ourselves about. Um, but it's not the story that lingers when a building is done. And it's not the story that gets the narrative weight uh, when a city emerges or a nation. Um, and that bothers me. Um, that walking the iron is everything. Uh, the railroads that 
traversed this country so this country could be what we call a country. The labor that happened there gets erased and discounted. And so if I have to spend the rest of my life retelling labor stories that are beautiful, that's okay. There'd be worse ways to spend your life <laughs> telling <laughs> stories about recovering our labor um, and the labor of the person next to you in the most loving way possible, rather than focusing on the famosity of what the next building is. There'd be worse ways to spend a life. And it's, especially in the idea of the Statue of Liberty, like literally, I mean, this is not, we don't even need a metaphor here. She comes in parts. She did. And then it was up to individual people to put her back together. This is so amazing as an allegorical impulse, too, because women are objectified in the exact same way in American culture. We're seen and consumed in pieces. And so that this statue of our founding is, has that to its history. It's just America is so beyond irony. It's like, why do we even use that word? It's just, it's just like a big cartoon parade balloon. Uh, and I don't know how we can walk around with a straight face anymore, except to Trump, it's like, oh, Jesus, good Lord. Um, but that, you know, this, this magnificent, iconic figure coming in pieces, and oh yeah, it's a woman, that was obs I was obsessed with. But then also, I know you all know this um, if you're from here or have lived here a long time, there was another statue planned that would um, be across the harbor so they'd be you know, seeing each other, same height, Native American. And the what ifness of a story of America that might have emerged with these two statues and let's say the, the Lady Liberty still had the shackles up in her hand where you could see them to represent emancipation. And this Native American statue, they got all the way to the dedication ceremony. More than one tribe was there. And then the money went away. But this is the what ifness of storytelling. What if they both emerged and looked at each other? <laughs> And what the hell story could have come from that? Not the one that came. Not the one we inherited. And so I still believe in the what if, but we have to like go get it. We can't just wait for it. Um, but I went off a little bit there. So. I mean, please. Um, I think speaking of irony in America, um, you, you get very into the idea of what what does liberty actually mean? Um, and what does America say that the Statue of Liberty means? Can you tell us, distinguish between all of the different definitions? Well, I'm hoping that the story opens certain words back up to possibility meanings for change. So the title is one of those words. Uh, this character, Lysve, is one of those words, and her name means liberty in Lithuanian. The word liberty, the word love, the word storytelling. There are several words that the word rope, the word apple, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if words could be reactivated to shift meanings and change meanings and come to life over again, and if enough of us got together to reroute the stories, um, we have a chance. I'm not saying it's a solution, but we have a chance. Every day of our lives, people with power over us are trying to pull meaning away from us and convince us to despair and quit trying. But we still have bodies, we still have imaginations, and we still have the heart to give a shit about each other, so there's still a chance. Is storytelling going to save the world? No, but it certainly fucked us, didn't it? <laughs> so if that's true, just what if, just maybe. Can't hurt. And in that light, tell us about the title of the book. 
which is a word we encounter many times. Yes. Um, so this, this word, thrust, um, when you first hear it, you could, maybe not you, but some people get a kind of pop-up thought in their head that's sort of white, male, heterosexual, obscene. Like Leonardo DiCaprio going... <laughs> Like, you can't help it. It kind of just pops in there. It's like, ah, get out of my head. That's terrible. <laughs> but then underneath that, what I'm trying to tickle you with or seduce you with is that what if thrust could be reclaimed and be um, the hips of a woman giving birth or the way trees push up from these enormous root systems and reach towards sky? Or the Statue of Liberty's arm, which is not phallic. It's weird. I don't know what it is. It's got this flame and it's headed toward the sky, but it's not phallic. It's some odd otherness we could reimagine. Or um, children. The imagination of children is unstoppable. Their questions are unstoppable. Their desire is unstoppable. It's a thrusting into the world. Or worms that move more dirt than you could possibly imagine. And if you really are a nerd, you'll go look that up tonight. How much <laughs> dirt do they really move? It's incredible. That thrusting, unstoppable worm, right? Or just imagination itself, that that thrust is alive and beautiful and vibrating in all of us, if you pull it away from what we've been told it is. And so it's a model word like other words in the story that I'm just trying to get your body to vibrate with possible meaning making. <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing. Lydia, thank you so much. We're going to take questions from the audience, but first, maybe a round of applause. <laughs> Um, so yeah, raise your hand if you would like to ask a question. Uh, I can start us off. Oh. Um, so when you spoke about how you know there's story within the body, and you know it holds more than just trauma that you can hold these tendrils of the story. Um, I I haven't read Thrust yet, but I also feel that that really resonates for your memoir, The Chronology of Water. And I That's where I learned it. Yes, I want to listen to you and follow you. <laughs> Keep talking. Yes. <laughs> oh, I should I should rephrase too for the um, audience at home. Um, wow, how do I do that? Um, no, no, but I meant that in an articulate way. <laughs> um, if if stories are at the root of us, and 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 it's not just our traumas, and we. You learned this in, in, in writing your memoir. How has that evolved? Is that fair? Um, I love every word you said, so thank you for that. I'm grateful for that, hearing that. Um, if, if I begin to tell stories of different places in my body where I'm holding, sorry to use a drug metaphor, but you know, our bodies are holding things, <laughs> um, releases occur. And what that generates is uh, the idea that each piece of trauma or pain or difficulty is sedimentary. It's a piece of something, it's sediments. And if it's sediments, they lead to other sediments and they break down into smaller and smaller pieces and they can become something else. This is why storytelling is a transformational space. And staring at the ocean actually helped me figure this out because the ocean is filled with live things and dead things all the time, right? All over the world. And it spits shit up onto the shore that's living or dead. Um, and it combines matter into things like rocks or breaks them down into sand. And I, I actually believe that that's possible for us as well. 
and storytelling and oceans help, help me you know, feel that and achieve that. So this corporeal writing practice is, yes, asking your shoulder questions, asking your gut questions, asking the person next to use neck questions, <laughs> and seeing what comes forth and what that illuminates for you in a, and giving you motion inside your emotion so that you're not just overwhelmed by it and shut down. And I could talk a really long time about that, but is that yeah. semi-satisfactory answer? That's great. Thank you so much. And I've watched it happen. It's not like I'm just making this up. I watch it happen with people who try it and start telling their stories. And they're like, oh my god, I didn't know that was in there. Oh no, look under there. And um, it's, it's, not, it's a release from the tyranny of your past. in the oldest form we can imagine, which is an oral tradition, storytelling. It's how the first peoples helped each other. But dunderheads got in and convinced us to stop doing it. <laughs> OK, I haven't like fully formed this question yet, so I'm going to try. But when you think about like the sediments and everything, and then especially with the chronology of water, which I'm reading right now, I always sort of saw like the writing of traumatic memoirs almost as like a brooding of oneself in order to transform oneself. And then when you speak about, you know, the transformation that takes place and everything like that, I don't know if this is like too wild of a question, but what did it feel like for you when you finished this book? What did it feel like to you when you finished your memoir? Like I was released back into the storytelling motion of everybody else and all existence. Like the me that was overwhelmed by my sad sack drama mm -hmm. was really a particle of an existence much larger than me that I could live with because it's smaller. And it's part of a giant ocean of storytelling in which we all participate. But until that moment, I was carrying it like with ego. Mm -hmm. This is my pain. Mm -hmm. Never going to get over it. It may kill me. And so that release. Am I a better person? I don't know. Do I fuck up less? No. <laughs> it's just different. <laughs> Take different things to mess up. Um, am I going to be without pain the rest of my life? No. But I now know to let it move through me and, and watch for the spaces where I can become part of stories larger than me instead of making it all me. Uh, which isn't, I don't know anything more than you do, but you ask me, and so that's what happened to me. You know? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> um, I was just curious about that, about where that came from and how it's weighed into the story and how you were able to get inside such a special brain like that. Thank you for noticing, first of all. Um, do you want to... Tell us about Lysa's <laughs> brain. <laughs> She's partially made from uh, traits that are true for me. Um, especially when I was a girl, I had non-neuronormative things. I'll just shorthand it. Um, but we weren't talking about it in those ways in 1963 or 65. Or we were talking about it differently. So partly traits I grew up with and was treated a certain way because I had these differences. And partly many people I have worked with who also see and feel the world differently. And I wanted to honor both the girl I was. I wasn't wrong. I was right about how I saw things. And there was just no language or recognition or legitimacy to my experience. Um, and so I'm trying to get on the page that 
legitimacy and honoring and respecting that you could be a very different kind of person than everyone around you and see and feel and hear and, and experience all of life differently. Um, and that doesn't mean you're lesser or wrong or in need of medication. Maybe it does. But you have a vision that we need right now. And so it's an homage to those kinds of differences in children that get so quickly pathologized. Um, and I just appreciate you for noticing that. I think it's just so amazing. Um, I think, yeah, sorry, um, hi. Um, um, so I just graduated high school. Um, I actually went to high school in Florida too. And um, my friends and I freshman year signed up for a writing class together at Cathedral. And um, the first semester we read a chapter from the chronology of water of the best friend. And for years, I mean, literally until the last weeks of school, we had this, like, we were like, we want to read the rest of the book. We want to read a book from Lenny Dukovich. And we were like, oh my god. And it would be so cool if we wrote to her, like, come talk to our class. And so I guess in some ways, this is like, my whole class is like, gonna. This is the best thing ever. <laughs> Oh, do what I did my whole life from age about 14 to now. Get copies of all the books you're not supposed to read and put them in public places, like <laughs> bathrooms and bus stops and parks and just in the road. I mean, I've been on tour. We're buying extra ones. I'm putting them random places just in case. Um, but, you know, you have to find ways to um, uh, smoothly agitate not just for yourself, and I already adore you forever. You need anything you call me, <laughs> I will help. I'd love to come there and just say, what's this shit? <laughs> um, but for all of us, you know, uh, uh, under the radar agitation and making access and availability to the art we already know will save us um, is something anyone, anywhere can do. All the stuff feels overwhelming, but anybody can put some books out in public places, other books, you know. Um, and so I think we should have a mission that we're deciding on tonight. Everybody tonight, think of some books you can go get that are trouble books of some sort. And just slip them into public spaces where you know people need them. And we'll start the project tonight. Deal? I want to say thank you so much to everyone who came out. Thank you, Maris, for joining us in conversation. Thank you, Julia, for having this show. As I said earlier, Lydia will be signing and personalizing books at the desk in the back. We ask that you give her a minute to get set settled, but then please make your way downstairs so that our event staff can start to break down and rearrange the space. Again, we have plenty of copies available to purchase tonight, and if you're still with us on the YouTube live stream, we'd love to encourage you to buy a copy online. All right, that's all for me. Thank you all so much for coming out. Let's give these two more nice round of applause.